Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome at CC, hello and welcome at one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. There we go, rolling. The beautiful thing about documentaries is it takes you out into the world beyond yourself and beyond your own life experience, uh, at least of growing up. And, and forces you to focus your energies and attention and observation on the lives of other people. And I, I love that I feel like I'm always learning something in a profound way. I just felt like, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, this film getting the nomination for me personally feels like a bit of an honor for all the stories over the years that I've had the pleasure and privilege to tell. Because they, they like most of the films I've done, are people that most of us would never have heard of if not for a film being made. They're not famous people at all. And most of my career has been devoted to telling the stories of people who are marginalized in America and not famous, but still have, in my view, important stories to be heard. And the songs fit right in in that way. So I, I did I did kind of think about this more across my career. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 62. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. I can remember a time back around February of 1995. I was about eight months out of college. And like so many of my friends around that time who were also fresh out of the college life experience, I was kind of without direction, poking around the Buffalo, New York area, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my degree in communications media and my dreams for becoming the next Oliver Stone. At that time, I simply stayed in my college town for lack of anything better to do, and I took the first job I could get, which happened to be working as a lab tech at a juice factory in the town of Dunkirk, New York. One night, I was driving back from visiting some relatives. It was raining outside, and I was probably driving an 88 Dodge Daytona. Still the most comfortable seating of any car I've ever driven, by the way. Those seats, they'd just suck you up in cocoon-like fashion, which probably wasn't great for driving distances at night and trying to fight off sleep. So to combat this, I had my car window just slightly open. I was sipping on some gas station coffee, and I was listening to the radio. Scanning through the dials, I ended up on a station that was having this lengthy conversation with a young filmmaker who had the plainest, most non-Hollywood name in the world, Steve James. It, it took seven and a half years to make. Uh, we shot for about four and a half. This I didn't recognize the name, but as soon as I heard him talking film, I was instantly engaged. At the time, if you'd walked into the room of the house that I was sharing, you would have walked into a room with movie posters all over the wall, stacks of movie magazines in the corner. VHS tapes were all neatly lined up, in alphabetical order of course, right next to my music collection. So to say that I was mildly obsessed with movies and movie making, that would have been an understatement. So again, when I heard this guy talking about his film, I soaked up every last word. 
The interviewer was commending this filmmaker on his first ever film, a documentary film called Hoop Dreams, which followed these young inner city kids from Chicago through the course of seven or so years as they attempted to live out their dreams of becoming players in the National Basketball Association. The interviewer was going on about how the film apparently should have been nominated for an Academy Award, that there was some apparent controversy surrounding the fact that it hadn't been nominated. And throughout the whole conversation, I was just struck with how down-to-earth, unassuming, smart but not condescending this, this Steve James character sounded. And how grateful he sounded not only to be working in the film biz, but to be receiving great reviews and press about his film, this film, Hoop Dreams. That following weekend, I found a theater in the city that was playing Hoop Dreams. I took a friend with me and we sat in this cool kind of art theater in Buffalo. The name escapes me now. What I saw that day changed the way I thought of film forever. I'd never seen anything like it, truth be told. First of all, I'd never actually gone to see a documentary on the big screen. Seeing docs in the theater, it's not a big deal at all today, of course, but back then, it was still a bit of a rarity for a doc to even get a theatrical release, let alone be available in many theaters across the country. Secondly, combined with the radio interview that I'd heard the week prior, this film gave me reason to believe that a person like me, someone with no connections, very little money, without even owning a camera, could find a way to get a film made and seen. Fast forward to 32 years later. Steve James is a name that is recognized by just about anyone in the doc industry. Films like Hoop Dreams, Stevie, The Interrupters, they're the stuff of legend. And now with his latest film, Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, he has finally been nominated for that ever-elusive Academy Award for Best Documentary. And 32 years later, I too have long since found my way into the industry, though certainly not in as prolific a fashion as Steve, but I have been working in film and TV for a while nonetheless. And now today, 32 years after sitting in that Dodge Daytona, driving in the rain and listening to that young man whose words inspired and enlightened me so long ago, today I am sitting down to have a shared conversation with Steve James, one documentary filmmaker to another one doc lifer to another. And I can only hope that after listening to this conversation, you too may find yourself inspired and informed, and that it will propel you forward as you continue living and leading this thing that we've all come to know and love, this thing that we call our doc life. That coming up in just a few short moments, here on The Documentary Life. Over the last few years, as we've met and connected with more and more doc lifers, we've been asked what the most comprehensive doc filmmaking course out there is. The truth is, we didn't believe there was one. There are plenty of videos and some courses that walk you through some technical aspects of filmmaking and workshops that cover some of the business aspects, but there was nothing that specifically took the doc filmmaker through the whole actual doc filmmaking journey, both creative and business, from A to Z. That is, until we created one. The Documentary Academy is the only all-in-one online documentary film production course that actually starts from the beginning of your film's journey, from story conception, through pre-production and actual production, to post-production, and through to the promotions, marketing, and distribution of your film. The Academy will help you make your most successful documentary film by guiding you on the journey from conception to launch. But don't just take our word for it. Have a look for yourself by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy and discover everything that the Academy has to offer, including a video that takes you inside the Academy for a look around. The Documentary Academy has already greatly helped others realize their power and potential as doc filmmakers. Why not be the next person who brings an awesome documentary film to life? Head on over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy today, and we'll see you there.
I am ecstatic and, and elated and extremely happy, if you could say all of those three words at the same time, to bring on doc filmmaker, legendary doc filmmaker, if you will, Steve James. Steve, it is an absolute uh, pleasure and honor to have you on The Documentary Life. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you have just come off of being awarded your first Academy Award nomination for your, your current film, Abacus. Um, congratulations, of course, for that, you know, first and foremost. I think what I'd love to do to kind of get into this, Steve, is let's start a little bit really with some of your background. I would love to hear personally how and why, how and why you first actually got into filmmaking. Well, um, I got into it because when I was a junior in college back in Virginia, I always liked movies. I liked going to see movies and I liked challenging movies. Mm -hmm. And I heard about this English class where you just got to watch movies <laughs> and, and talk about them. And I, and I heard it was, you know, it was, it was, wasn't just an easy class cause I don't, it wasn't that easy, but right. it was just a great class. So I took it with a professor named Ralph Cohen and we studied, he, he had been doing a survey class of the history of cinema, but he was kind of tired of that. So the semester I took it, he decided to do auteurs and we, we looked at the films of, uh, of, uh, Ernst Lubitsch, Jean Renoir. Yeah. Um, Hitchcock and Arthur Penn and I, I just sort of felt hook, line and thinker at that point in love with movies at that point and and I had no idea how I could do anything in film because mm. in Virginia there was not really a film industry but mm -mm. I don't know I just decided I wanted to try to do something about it and so I started making little Super 8 films right. uh and then eventually found my way to southern illinois university where i went to grad school okay. and got a master's in film and then from there i had this idea to do hoop dreams while i was still in school down there and <laughs> and the move to chicago was you know in part to want to pursue that that film I would say having, of course, the filmmakers that you just named and 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 taking this this class in school, uh, I, I would love to hear how you went at some point from perhaps narrative to documentary film. Why was documentary something that that really spoke to you, especially um, considering it sounds like a lot of the film that you had studied was of the, the narrative form, narrative fiction yeah. form. Yeah, I fell in love with movies, not documentaries. Yeah. Um, I'd hardly seen any documentaries yep. uh, when, when, when the, at this time. And I think what contributed to it were two things. One is is that at the time I fell in love with movies, I was, I was thinking that my career might take me in the direction of radio uh, journalism. There was a, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> yeah, there, there, was an NPR, there was an NPR station uh, affiliated with the uh, school, uh, and, and I worked there and I thought this is really cool and and so I had a journalism bent if you will yes. and when I got to grad school though there was a very influential professor uh, I had there named Mike Cobell he's retired now uh, and he loved docs and when I took the very first uh, production class where we were shooting Super 8 mm. <laughs> um, he showed us a lot of documentaries and and just inspired me uh, about what documentaries could be and do and so I think that documentary combined both those interests. My first Super 8 films were documentaries, and, uh, and they were, and, and I just found, you know, it, it wasn't like I made a decision then that I'm going to be a documentary filmmaker at all. But I do recall feeling a real satisfaction when, in like profiling the landlady for the um, apartment complex where my wife who was my wife then but uh where where we lived mm. and she she was a you know a woman with a eye patch and was very religious and used to sing hymns and i just thought this is a fascinating person <laughs> i need to know? tell this story <laughs> i need to tell the story yeah <laughs> It's interesting that you would mention that you didn't have a lot of interest or exposure to doc filmmaking and 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 for my sort of journey or or maybe even entrance into the world of doc filmmaking at all um, and I'm talking back in probably this would have been 94 or 95 when when Hoop Dreams had just come out sort of theatrically and and I know I'm on I know I'm not alone here in in saying that this was my first exposure ever to documentary film certainly yeah. on on the big screen and and other than I think um 
sort of Vietnam, Vietnam War doc docs that I had seen. I just really had there wasn't that much exposure for documentary in my life. Um, and 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 interestingly enough, here we are, 25 years later, and I'm speaking to the gentleman that perhaps inspired and influenced me early on. Because again, Hoop Dreams is the first film, the first documentary certainly that I that I ever saw on the big screen. Uh, I, I imagine you hear that often or have over the years. Uh, I do hear that a yeah. lot, and and it's it's one thing I never get tired of hearing. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, you know, people love Hoop Dreams, and they'll tell me how much they love the movie. But but when I hear when I hear from filmmakers who say that 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 was their entry point into doc filmmaking, mm. it's 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 especially nice to hear that because I've heard that from some pretty darn talented filmmakers over the years, yeah. and. And and it's interesting to me too, though, because you know I did start to get exposed once I fell in love with documentary. Then you know, then I started to seek out documentaries to watch right. and made a point of seeing them, and ones that were very influential to me. But but it 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 didn't happen in the way it happened for you, and and you know, and I think increasingly happens not not with hoop dreams, but increasingly happens nowadays for young filmmakers is right. is that. The presence of documentaries in our culture is so significant, both not just theatrically, but but in in every respect. Right. That uh, I think now to come along and be a young person who's interested in film, I, I meet a lot of really young filmmakers for yeah. whom Hoop Dreams wasn't the 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 touchstone. But, yeah, yeah. But that they just realize that there's a this is something they want to do. They didn't get they didn't fall into documentary like I did in a way. Right. They want to make documentaries. And I think technology certainly has played a part in that as well. I know for me, it's funny, as we're having this conversation, Steve, it, it jogs a memory of uh, uh, I had already seen Hoop Dreams and I'm driving late at night and I'm listening to an extended conversation between yourself and the interviewer. I couldn't even tell you what the program was. Huh. It was it was a moment for me because I remember thinking, ah, it's no longer this film thing, this filmmaking thing, it's no longer inaccessible to a guy like me. Um, technology has, has changed, like digital film, like digital video is right there now. And there's, you know, people are making films, digital films. And now here's this guy talking about this unbelievable documentary that I saw. And, and now he's like, now he's a name and, 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 and his film is doing incredibly well. And, and I remember that, uh, have, you know, hearing that conversation on the radio. So, um, yeah, well, well, thank you for that. Years later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, Steve, what something I'd like to hear, and I and I know I know, know my listeners would also appreciate. Um, I'd love to hear what are any keys to longevity in this industry, in this thing we call doc filmmaking. You know, it, it's not as if you're churning out, you know, over a 25, 30 year period. It's, it's not as if, Steve, you're churning out films every two years. And, and in particular with doc films, and I think you've done a number of log of the longitudinal variety. It takes time. It takes time to fundraise. It takes time to conceptualize. It takes time to, to spend time with people and families immersing yourself in a film. And then, of course, there's the post-production and whole distribution afterwards. How in the heck do we stay in the game, Steve? Steve, what's the key to longevity here in this industry? Well, first, I should say that I, um, um, even though I don't put out a film every year, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not Woody Allen. Uh, I, when I think about it, um, I'd have to do the math on it to yeah. be completely sure. But but since Hoop Dreams came out, which took seven and a half years to make, right, right and right. and came out in '94. So since then, in the what twenty four years since, I've probably made between documentaries and I've done, I've done three narrative things. Right. I did this film Prefontaine. I did a couple of TV movies as well some years ago. Yes, I I've probably made I don't know thirteen or fourteen films. Okay, okay, there you go. Uh, and if you do the math, that comes out every couple of years. You're right. About every couple of years. Yeah. So um, so I have been pretty prolific, and that, I think that's. Part of um, the answer to your question, though, mm. is, is that um, for me anyway, is is that I have gone from film to film, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I like to say, and it's you know, it's not a joke, but it may sound funny, is is that if I'm not making a film, I'm not eating. So oh, right, uh, and and you know, my wife and I have raised a family. We have three kids. Yes, and she works. Uh, so you know. I've been one of the lucky ones in a lot of ways right. for sure because I've been able to have longevity and been able to kind of continue to do what I do 
and I've mostly been able to make the films I want to make. Yeah. And part of the part of the answer to your question is is I I have to keep um, when I'm I, I the way I like to work is I like to be heavily almost exclusively if I can focused on a single film. But as okay. I get into the post part of that particular film, uh, and because I edit myself, yes. I, it's very, you know, it's very, uh, you know, um, <laughs> it, it's very hard to do this sometimes because it's so consuming. Right. Um, and how I, are you going to be I, developing projects at all if you're that consumed in, your, in, in the one that you're doing currently? Right. But I force myself to do that. Yeah. I, I'm sure that I I am now planting the seeds for the next thing, yeah. so that when this one ends, I have a decent hope of moving on to something else. Right now, now the other key has been that I also have had um, some commercial representation, and over the years, it seems yeah. like when I really need uh, some money and. Um, <laughs> Um, between projects, some kind of commercial oriented thing will pop up. Usually it's like webisode yeah. advertising, you yeah, know, yeah. because it's longer and, you know, and, and just more suits me. Yeah. Uh, so I've had that happen, which is, which has been helpful. And then the, the third thing I'd mention is, is that I also on mine, you know, I wear multiple hats mm. um, as a filmmaker. So on any given project that I'm doing, um, when I, if you know, when 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 I'm able to raise the money for it, which I've been pretty pretty lucky with, yeah, there's a there's a substantial part of that budget that I can claim for myself as a filmmaker because I'm doing the job. I'm right. I you know I am a producer. I'm the director. In recent years, I've been shooting. Um, you know, it's like I'm going backwards in my career, and <laughs> and then I'm also frequently more way more often than not the you know one of the editors, if not the editor, and right. so. So I, you know, I'm able to tap into a number of the lines in my budget and and pay myself to do it. But of course, I have to do the work too. So right. you know, it's not it's not like free money. Well, there's a couple of things there that that we can touch or that you've touched upon. And uh, and like yourself, well, I wouldn't say like yourself because I think you you it, you're much more entrenched, obviously, in the documentary world. My doc life very much consists of doing commercial. That's, I mean, commercial work and, and, and at times the corporate video work is what I've been doing for years. And that right. has allowed me and allowed me really to to um, to pursue, pursue the documentary passion. And I think that's a case with a lot of people that listen to absolutely. the program as well. Um, and some people and some people teach. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. You know, that's a that's another uh, foundation, I think, for a number of filmmakers is, is that is that they will teach now you know whether it's at the collegiate level or, or somewhere else hmm. but um you know again that's not something everybody can get because teaching jobs are not easy to get but right. but that is that is one path that people have done the other thing that i'm glad that you brought up is this idea of budgeting for yourself because i think we as doc filmmakers can get stuck in this idea in particular when we're you know filling out the paperwork for grant applications when you're filling out these line items for your budget it's easy to kind of either forget or neglect to put yourself in that budget <laughs> simply because you're afraid that it just makes your budget that much bigger or or this sort of imposter syndrome, right? Like, who am I to ask for money for myself? But it's yeah. critical. We have to be doing that as doc filmmakers, don't we? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I yeah, I, I, if you want to make a living doing it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody sort of. I wouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people have have kind of one documentary or one film mm -hmm. in them, uh, and they will, you know, frequently. And, and this was true on Hoop Dreams. Mm -hmm. They will frequently. It will be a labor of love, uh, for which they will not get paid much money, or in some cases, not any money, right? Um, to get it done, and and that's inspiring and great and quite an accomplishment to get your film done and and have done it without paying yourself anything but mm. that's that's no recipe for longevity yeah, it's or, not sustainable is it <laughs> or career and yeah. you know i read somewhere that that you we would be surprised at the number of people who have had films premiere at sundance and never made another film yeah it's unreal that there there are a lot of them and and it's weird because you would think well once you've had a film at sundance yep. you You've made it. There you go. You're you, there. You're in. You're in. <laughs> yeah, not the case. I'd love to ask, how did you support yourself during that time? Say the seven years of filmmaking when you're doing your first doc, when you're working on Hoop Dreams. What is it there that you're doing at that time to help support yourself? Well, so I I came to Chicago with a MFA in film production. Right, right. Uh, I I stuck around 
uh, I went to Southern Illinois University. I'd stuck around Carbondale uh, getting that degree for quite a long time okay. because, frankly, I think I was afraid to try and deal with the real world. Yeah, well, you and me uh, both. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I remember so that. By, so by the time we moved to Chicago, uh, I, I think I can safely claim I was the oldest, most educated production assistant. <laughs> Again, we per- have things in common, my friend. <laughs> per- per- perhaps, perhaps in America, certainly in Chicago. Yeah. And I, so I started out at the bottom rung. My very first uh, paid job in Chicago uh, was probably one of my best PA jobs, which was standing at Oak Street Beach in the summer. Um, <laughs> Were you doing a lock-off? <laughs> well, yeah, part of the lock-off, but also um, giving, um, you know, very attractive women in bikinis a dollar to walk pass behind the camera where the action was going on. Uh, that, that probably was one of my best PA jobs. After that, it was all downhill. It, totally. And, <laughs> That's where PA yeah. is great, but you know, yeah. it's not usually like that. Yeah. So I, I started out as a PA on commercials, Yeah. which, which at times could be quite humiliating for someone uh, of my age and education level. How old were you at um, that time when you were first starting as a PA? I, I was, I was 30. Well, okay, yeah. I think I was I think I was thirty four. Oh wow. So yep. you've okay, I can no longer make this claim. Wow, wow. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's good so, or not. <laughs> <laughs> I cede I the title to you. Oh boy. Uh, but but yeah, so it was it was tough, but um, you know, the thing that sustained me was that I had this project that we were doing. Yeah. That's that right. was something I cared deeply about yep. and 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 made me feel like I was going somewhere uh, absolutely even, that's what i even, did <laughs> even though i didn't have i wasn't getting paid we weren't getting paid any money to speak of to do it we started hoop dreams on a two thousand dollar illinois arts fellowship yep yep um, <laughs> and there was no more money for three years um <laughs> before we got money again and then we started to get quote unquote real money but never enough to have compensated ourselves for all that that went into it yeah but and, and another piece of what sustained me is is that after doing working in the commercial end of the business and i kind of worked my way up the food chain in that i worked my way up to production coordinator and then production manager and right. then before i kind of left doing that kind of work uh, for good i was i even produced a, a couple of commercials mm. Uh, which really made me realize that I re- didn't want to produce commercials because I didn't want to pre- I didn't want to pretend I cared <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, about what we were making a commercial about. But Cartemquin Films, which has been my production home yes. all these years, they were a big key part of sustaining me during Hoop Dreams because eventually they started to give me work, and and a lot of it was like sponsored film work, you know, for an organization, mm. a video for an organization, mm. and. But it, it it sure beat um, the commercial stuff, yeah, and yeah. and so I started to just do work at Cartemquin while I was doing Hoop Dreams, and and that was a big part of sustaining me through that project. It's it's nice to hear uh, another another sort of successful PA story, and it's also good to sort of <laughs> <laughs> it's good to share that I think with, with our listenership because you know you mentioned something that certainly spoke to me, uh, Steve, is is that. Similarly, um, because I had started later on, uh, uh, in, you know, started in my 30s as well. One of the things that really sustained me, because of course I'm looking around me, and, and the other PAs are like 20 years old, and and yeah. and for yeah. me, part of what sustained me was having this other project. And and for me, my first doc project was a a film that I that I was shooting in Nepal, and. I remember that that really kind of kept me in the game and it kept me from, you know, just above those levels of depression, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. But there's a lot to be said for, you know, cutting your teeth and working on sets and seeing how the industry works. And one of the things, and I don't know if this happened for you, probably didn't happen for you, but I'll share it, is that I had a realization pretty early on in working in these sets was that I sort of wrongfully assumed that anybody and everybody that works in film they're all, we're all filmmakers. Right. And that was kind of an awakening for me to realize that is not necessarily the case at all. These people that I, people that I, this, you know, that I'm working with, most of them, in fact, are not filmmakers. They're technicians that are working on the film sets and working on the feature films and, and working on the commercials where I'm PAing. And, and that was an eye opener for me to realize, oh, actually, not everybody here at all is a filmmaker. These are, these are paid and hired hands that are technicians that are incredibly skilled um, labor for sure. But, but they're not filmmakers. That was, a, that, was a, that was an eye opener for me. 
Yeah, I think actually where I first got that sense, but not fully formed like you just articulated, was the very first commercial I worked on was when I was still in southern Illinois, mm -hmm. and a Chicago production company came down to shoot two uh, spots for the state of Illinois, and one of them was the the most ambitious commercial I ever worked on, <laughs> and it was my first. They they did a Civil oh, wow. War reenactment, and they had, and and I was like the location person, oh. very 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 underpaid, <laughs> yeah. um, but but you know there you go. But yeah. I remember going to dinner with the director <laughs> and the producer and uh, some other key people, and. Yeah, I don't know why it was. It surprised me, you know. Now thinking yeah. about it, but I just remember thinking they spent the entire meal uh, either talking about restaurants in Chicago, <laughs> uh, which they were not in, or uh, occasionally about a spot they'd seen that they thought was really good or really bad, <laughs> and 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 it was all so insular, you know what I mean? Oh, and yeah. I remember thinking, why aren't we talking about film? Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 <laughs> and exactly. And that, that's because that, that wasn't their world, and isn't, which is not to say they didn't like films, but right. that was their world. It was, uh, their world was commercials and restaurants, you know, because that's what matters on commercials <laughs> is where, you, where you're eating. So, so you know, I, I certainly got that same impression over the years, but I have to say that I ran into so many people in those early years who were hugely supportive. They they, they yes. knew what I was trying to do yep. apart from this job. And they were hugely supportive. In fact, there was a production company here in Chicago that the director owner of the company was so supportive that they would often, this is when I was a production manager, they would often say, hey, we, we've got a couple of jobs coming up. Which one works best for you? <laughs> yes. Isn't in terms of In terms of you shooting on, on your film. Yeah. And, and I would be able to pick and choose when I worked, which is, you know, for a freelancer is, is not, is a luxury. It so. certainly is. It certainly is. I, yeah, it's, it's nice. I, I worked primarily in the Portland, Oregon industry and, and I found it to be an incredibly supportive community and the commercial people, when they would hear sort of about my doc life and the doc projects that I was working on 95% of the time, all I ever got was, was support. So I was very appreciative of that as well. You know, the other thing I want to mention that I really took away from that time, uh, which I've tried to apply, yeah. you know, throughout my career is <clears throat> if you start at the bottom, like you and I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, of, of the food chain in, in, in the commercial film world, you know, you learn pretty quickly whether they're there, in my view, there, there are basically two kinds of people in this world, mm. uh, not just in that industry. They're the people that treat people according to their rank, uh, they're, and they're the people that treat people according to who they are uh, yeah. as people. And I ran into both kinds, absolutely. Uh, you know, and and I, one of the things I was determined to do is even as I moved up the food chain yep. in that world, but especially in my world as just a filmmaker. Period, is to how you treat people matters yes. a lot. Yeah. And there, there are too many people that as they get some power and prestige, you know, in, in this industry, um, kind of forget that mm. and don't treat people well that, that are quote unquote beneath them in the pecking order. I'm so happy that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy that you said that. Steve, somewhat maybe correlated to that can you share with us can you share a low point of your career and this can be whether it's working in commercial or or even certainly documentary film i would love to hear a story or, or something that you can recall that that was that was that really sort of maybe may, maybe perhaps made you pause and think ah is this the right thing for me so were there any low low moments that you could share with us from your career uh, well, I, I can remember one very distinctly. Um, I can remember two actually, but and it's they're they're very different. One was <clears throat> when I was making Hoop Dreams, and we were we were limping along without money, and I was you know this is when I was a PA, and I worked on this one particular job where the um, the production coordinator at one point uh, came over to me, and and my job on that on that commercial was really low level. A friend of mine who worked in as a PA, we used to have a, a scale that we, we called it the HQ scale, the humiliation quotient. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so, 
And so this was a high HQ job. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, the, the production coordinator came over and she was a nice person, you know, probably five, six years younger than me. Um, I was in fact lying about my age at that time. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 it's I'd like shaved, online dating. Yeah. I, I'd shaved three years off of my real age. Totally. Um, and, uh, uh, and so anyway, she came over and she just complimented me profusely for the way in which I kept the set swept up oh. and, and, and how, how I was so, so valuable to the team because I didn't need to be told to go pick up the trash uh, and sweep up. I just took it on my own. I, I showed real initiative. Uh, you know, she just was going on and on and on. And I know that in her mind, she was thinking, I'm doing that very thing that I just talked about a moment ago, that she was appreciating <laughs> yeah, someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what she didn't realize is, is that it was the most humiliating, one of the most humiliating uh, moments. Um, <laughs> And after she left, I called my wife from oh. the set, and I said, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, this might I, be it. <laughs> I, I think I may just have to, I, I just don't think I can do this. <laughs> and, and, and she gave me some encouraging words and said, well, you know, just get through this. Remember, you've got your project. Just yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. You know, don't, don't, you know, which was very valuable. The other low point for me and it, it wasn't a point of like I thought I'd give up but it was a real low point it was very educational for me was you know after the success of Hoop Dreams yeah which you know the kind of success that came with that film both in terms of critical you know attention and also opportunity for mm -hmm. me you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. was sort of off the charts um, I mean you couldn't ask for better <laughs> and and one of the things that happened as a result of that was is that I you know I I got an opportunity to make some films some narrative films and right. the first the first one was this film Prefontaine Pre that start, well. that start starred Jared Leto yeah uh, there was another one uh, made by Robert Town um, called Without Limits but you know we did the little PT boat version right. compared to the aircraft carrier version yeah. and and so you know when that film was completed you know we premiered at Sundance and got a middling review but then when it opened theatrically you know back then the press people would fax you the responses right now they should get, you, yeah, you yeah, get emails yeah. right so back then they would fax the responses and quotes from people as it was coming rolling out you know <laughs> in cities and the reviews you know we got you know we got some okay positive reviews but it's it's probably it's probably the worst reviewed film I've made. And there were some pretty, you know, un, unhappy <laughs> reviews <laughs> in that mix. And it got to a point where I'm here at the house, I was in this very house that I'm in now, and oh, wow. yeah, that's how long we lived here. And I would hear the fax machine go off, <laughs> and, I'd be, and, I, and I'd be like, I, I don't wanna go downstairs. <laughs> and look, but I, but I did, because yeah. I was torturing myself. So gotta I gotta know. <laughs> And I'd read them, and then I'd come back upstairs, and then I'd hear the fax machine go off again. <laughs> oh, God. So I would just remember that was a real cold splash in the face of like, you know, you've had this great success. Yeah, yeah. With Hoop Dreams. <laughs> that doesn't guarantee you're some kind of film genius uh, at all. <laughs> Not that I was inclined to think that way, but, but Prefontaine really drove that point home. And it made me have to become... Uh, tougher and a little um, <clears throat> more resilient yeah. about when you put films out in the world because that can be a scary time. Steve, what do you ultimately want out of your doc filmmaking career? I mean, here you've been making films now for um, over 25 years and, and, and an incredibly uh, well-recognized catalog of, of, of films and um, a bigger name in the doc filmmaking industry, certainly. So I'm curious... Um, where does it go from here in terms of where do you see, yeah, ultimately what you want of your, out of your doc career? Well, I, I feel like I'm getting what I want out of my doc career. And so I just, I just kind of want to keep getting that, which is I, you know, I get to keep making films, yeah. number one. And I, and I, and I, for the most part, uh, I've, I've been really fortunate to be able to make films I want to make. Like if I have an idea for film, I have, managed to find support and I feel like I've gotten funding in every conceivable way wow. that one can get funding on a film. Yeah. We've done it. 
And yeah. um, but I'm you know again if I were in narrative film and had the kind of um, ability to just to uh, make most of the films I want to make I would be Steven Spielberg or somebody you right, know what I mean it's right. like that's that's so rare in that world and I feel really fortunate in the doc world that that I've been able to do that and it doesn't mean that every film I've made was my idea at all no mm. uh, ideas are brought to me um, but then the process of then okay how do we go about funding them and making them I've been I've been fortunate to do that and then the other piece of that is that I just I not you know I've not gotten tired of the process of these films because they they take you into the world right you know the beautiful thing about documentaries is it takes you out into the world beyond yourself and beyond your own life experience uh, at least of growing up and and forces you to focus your energies and attention and observation uh, and it's not you know it's willful but on on the lives of other people and I and I love that I love that I feel like I'm always learning something uh, in a in a profound way and I love the process I mean the editing whether I'm actually physically doing it or not I love that process of just diving deep into the material that you have and shaping it to tell a story I do as well I've, I've edited all my films and in fact it's funny each film that I do I swear and and my wife Steph can attest to this that uh, I swear it'll be the last one that I edit that that you know what I need to yeah. bring someone else <laughs> on to do this but it, it's it's very difficult for me I love editing I love I like yourself I, I love the process of filmmaking so it's um and, and editing was was after being a PA editing was how I made sort of uh, the, the bread and butter for me and so it just that that's what I had done for so long that uh, it seemed like a natural progression that I would be editing my own films as well yeah yeah well and and the thing is is that that's the other piece when you're asking about how to sustain it helps to have a skill other than director right that you can do that people can hire you to do um, and and I, I edited on a number of of projects in those early years that I didn't have anything to do with other than coming in as an editor and they did help pay the bills and mm. build craft and build understanding build your craft, of yeah. stories you know editing is a great vantage point to really understand what it takes to make a movie and to uh, tell a story uh, tell a story one of our members of the, of our Dockland community um, has asked a question. Uh, uh, Jonathan from from the Dockland community asks: As beginning documentary filmmakers, we're often told to look for the conflict and build the story around that. Steve, how does your own style of storytelling work for or against that? And do you think it's good advice? That's a great question. I, you know, if you look at the body of my work, a lot of it is is centering on people's lives at some kind of critical juncture. Uh, and that, that may be, you know, there's, there's sort of, so there is inherent drama and, and, and often conflict in that, you know, Abacus, it's sort of like this trial, which is going to determine the fate of this tiny bank and whether this family is able to, in their view, save face from this whole episode. Right. Um, you know, film like Hoop Dreams, it's a more extended, uh, sort of key moment in their lives, but it's sort of like, will these young men or kids at that point be able to navigate the world of, of basketball and, and it's sort of the business of basketball and get what they want from it, which is, you know, if not the NBA, at least to college and, and, and what that could mean for them and their families. You know, I, I, could, I could sort of go through each of the films I want yeah, and point right. out the ways in which, so I do think that frequently, you, if what you don't want to do is drum up conflict that isn't there. I feel I, I do feel like I see documentaries from time to time, and I won't name them, but <laughs> where where the the conflict in the film has been exaggerated, mm -hmm. you can you can feel the filmmaker uh, sort of trying to pump up the drama uh, falsely mm -hmm. and and th that's the worst thing I think you can do because then that that for me that then ruins your credibility as a storyteller in that given film and mm -hmm. I, I stop believing what I'm seeing 
So I, I yes, obviously, that's that's actually um, really important to note there because I know exactly what you're talking about, and it happens, and it's a, it's not an uncommon thing. You can understand how it happens. There's many reasons that that a filmmaker may feel a need to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that that you know it's not good films are not all about conflict at all. Good films are also about just understanding people at a deeper level who they are, why they do the things they do, whether, whether what they do or not, you condone or not. And I feel like that's the, um, the ultimate secret is if you can intimately connect the audience with the, the, what's going on with the people you're following or the story you're following and, and help them care, even if they don't always agree, um, then you've got them and, and, and you've got them for all the right reasons in terms of telling the story. So, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not all about conflict. It's also about understanding and getting at deeper truths of who we are. Today, we are announcing the indictment of a federal savings bank on mortgage fraud, securities fraud, and conspiracy. A federally chartered bank that has been catering to the Chinese immigrant community since 1984. If you are going to pick on a bank, family-owned company, wedged between a couple of noodle shops in Chinatown, is about as easy a target as you could possibly pick. When I was a lawyer, there was no bank owned by Chinese and serving the Chinese. When I walk around here, I feel very much at home. This is a very uh, tasty uh, noodle shop. That's always special. That's the butt. <laughs> children. My dad was excited about this bank. He was going to start. We serve people who've never even dealt with the banking system before. This whole ordeal began in 2009. One of our loan officers stole money. He was lying all over the place. He was running a money laundering operation. I fired him that day. They went straight to their regulator and they told them about it. The DA's office started asking us questions. Wait a minute, maybe we're the target. If that prosecution goes through, that bank is going to go out of business. Although this is David versus Goliath, they're a whole family of lawyers. Abacus is an example of, of a film that was brought to me by Mark Mitten, one of the producers who had a life, uh, who, who, had, who had known the um, Sung family at the center of the story for over a decade. And, you know, he heard about this this case that was imminent where mm. their little community bank was going to be charged um, and be the only bank connected to the 2008 financial crisis that was being criminally charged. And it, the whole thing just sounded so ludicrous. So, you know, we went for a few days yeah. to New York to shoot. <clears throat> and based on that, I made the decision that I wanted to do this film. Mm. But that this is a perfect example of, of, you know, even at this point in my career, Mark, Mark put his own money in to just help us limp along oh, wow. during, during the shooting of the trial. I didn't get paid. I didn't get paid on this film until after it was completed because it, it took a while for us to find the uh, funding partner on this. And eventually it was ITBS and Frontline and Frontline right. was more than, more than just a funding partner as was ITBS. But yeah, that took a while. And, yeah. and so, you know, we had to be able to kind of do whatever we had to do to just get the film shot with the, you know, expectation that down the road we would we would be get enough compensation to pay ourselves. You know, so. at, well, I'm curious at what point in in the court case did you begin production, uh, full-scale production on the film? Cuz I'm trying to figure out sort of timelines having just recently seen it, I was I one of the things that I had wanted to ask you was sure. how much was reenactment versus how much were you filming as it happened? Well, yeah, we 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 filmed during mostly during the course of the trial itself. Yeah. Like I didn't even find out about the uh, about the story until the trial was imminent. Right. And so so that was our time frame, primary time frame for shooting. And that is sort of the spine of the story. It's like, you're, you know, we're with the songs outside the courtroom because we weren't allowed to film in the courtroom. Mm. And so all the courtroom stuff that you are hearing is you know reenactment uh, that we did after the fact, right? With um, we we were able to get the defense lawyers to play themselves, which gave it a kind of credibility that it wouldn't otherwise have as much. Um, we yeah. had to we had to cast the rest of it because the prosecution was not going to play no. themselves, <laughs> <laughs> and and nor were we going to be able to drag witnesses back and have them 
play themselves. So, so you know, that is the spine of the film, and that's really the heart of the story too. Is how are the Sungs navigating, you know, this this momentous uh, situation in in the lives of them personally as well as their their, their bank? And you know, if I would have loved to have had the more free reign access that I have had in other films uh, to be in the courtroom, to yeah, be right. in the deliberations, to, you know, to be on the prosecution side. I would have loved all of that. And we, we mm. certainly made an effort to try and get cooperation across the board, but it, it wasn't going to happen. And so we had to make the decision to go forward with the film with very limited access, but at least it was the key access, which was to the family. So, Steve, a lot of the documentary work that that I have done over the years has emanated from from South and Southeast Asia, um, and I've done a lot of uh, a bit of commercial work in China as well. And and, and, is, and a lot of the communities that I'm working with, if it's ever here in the U.S., they tend to be refugee communities. And when I heard about your film, um, I was immediately drawn to to the subject matter. Um, I'm curious, what what was it that spoke to you about this film? Was it the story? Was it the Sung family? I'm curious what you drew to tell this story um, of Chinatown. It was both. Uh, you know, first it w- first and foremost, it was the kind of broad strokes of the story. You know, here's this small community bank, the 2,651st largest bank in the United States, yeah. which doesn't make it tiny, tiny, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a several notches below the banks that were involved in the 2008 crisis, to say the least. And, <laughs> and they were being charged with fraud connected to that crisis. And, and on the face of it, it was like, okay, the bank themselves discovered the fraud. They fired the, the employee, the loan officer. Right. Then they initiated their own um, internal investigation, which they weren't required to do, and rooted out a couple other people that they thought could could be involved in some fraud. Got rid of them. Then you know they also reported it to their regulators, which they were required to do. They reported it to Fannie Mae, who were eventually the alleged victims right. of this fraud. And they cooperated with the DA's office because uh, for a while there, because they thought the DA uh, was was actually going to help them of course. clean up the situation, not uh, turn around and attack uh, the management of the bank and say, you orchestrated the fraud or turned your head the other way and encouraged it in some way, which just seemed ludicrous. <laughs> and you know, nothing, nothing that happened in the trial subsequently uh, ever shook me uh, from that belief that this was just a wrongful prosecution right. from the get-go. And then, of course, the fact that there seemed to be, you know, unintentional probably, but racist aspects to oh, this yeah. case uh, involving the Chinese community and this bank. <clears throat> uh, all of that contributed to me thinking, well, this is an important story, that, and no one was reporting on it. The New York Times wasn't reporting on it. No one in New York, except for an occasional article here and there, was really focused at all on this case. It was considered, I guess, too small or petty or meaningless to, right. to matter. So all of that appealed to me greatly. But then once I met the Sung family, yeah. I just was really struck by them. I was struck by their courage, their their uh, their integrity, uh, but also just how alive and and funny and <laughs> engaging they were. <laughs> and, you know, I, everything about them just made me go, th- these are people I want to spend time with. And th- I think that's a key in doing documentary, particularly if you're spending any amount of time with subjects is, I, I, they have to be people that really intrigue me, but I also, they have, they have to be people that I want to be around, um, which is why I don't do exposés on people that uh, I don't have, you know, like the, I'm not trying to make films where I'm taking somebody down. Um, because right, I, right. I'm, you, you encounter people along the way and they, they are in your films that, that are, that are not sympathetic <laughs> clearly, but, but my focus has never been on people that mm-hmm. I don't find in some way to be worthy of empathy and, and, and that, that, and, and I'm very interested in them. Yeah. I mean, including the DA in the film, I I would totally agree with that. One of the things that I really appreciated was the cultural aspect that you brought to this film. Um, and, and it's also a scary thing to know that, um, you know, in in this case, Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, in, in, in the case of, of your film, um, they're incredibly vulnerable communities and I really really appreciate that that you sort of spoke to that vulnerability I mean there's moments where I I just found myself thinking wow like you know there's how could a jury um not find like 
it would be very difficult to expect a jury to understand certain cultural nuances. Like, how do right. you explain that to a jury? I know them because I recognize them because I'm working in these communities. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just, it's it's a scary thing. It's a really scary thing. And well, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that I think that you know you hit on something there. It's like the DA, the DA's office, the 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 case they built against Abacus was in many ways designed to play off of that ignorance. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And to and to really paint the community as a lot of tax dodging, um, fraudulent people, That's both, right. uh, both getting the loans and issuing the loans and to try and horrify the jury. Cause there were no, you know, there were no Chinese Americans. Uh, there were no Asians at all on the jury. Um, <laughs> so, so I think that they really, you know, they, that, that became their tact of how they were going to win this case. And ultimately, well, we don't have to give it away, I right. guess, but, no, but it, it was, it was a real, um, it, it was a real challenge to refute that. And, and, you know, and the defense worked very hard to do that. Steve, when the film was finished, when it was finally finished and you sat back and you kind of took it all in, did you think at that moment, yes, this is an Oscar worthy film, or is that not something that you're thinking about? I tried, uh, I, I, over the years, uh, even starting with Hoop Dreams, I never really thought about the Oscars with Hoop Dreams. I mean, yeah. y yes, there was a lot of talk about it, right. and, and so it was impossible to get away from. <laughs> um, but when it, when it happened that we didn't get, well, actually, I was one of the three editors, and I was, I was nominated for an Oscar. Hoop Dreams got a, a very unusual yes. nomination in the crafts for editing. So <laughs> I was this is amazing. I, so I was uh, nominated as an editor and and um, you know attended the the the, the show yeah. and lost sat next to the guy that won you know <laughs> um, but I um, I I don't make the films and even then I didn't I didn't have some huge Oscar expectation I mean with Hoop Dreams it got so much love uh, that you know not getting an Oscar nomination as a film did not end up being for me any kind of big you know, sad moment. It didn't honestly. work against you, right? No, I mean, and the fact that people were so upset about it tells you something yeah. that, about how people felt about the film. And I've had that experience happen a few times over the years with yes. films like The Interrupters and with Life Itself, where there were expectations that those films were going to, you know, get nominated and and they didn't and life itself didn't even make the short I mean uh Interrupters didn't even make the short, short list, list which, right. which was a surprise. So I, I, I people, guess yeah. over the I guess over the years I've kind of come to to a kind of place of like you know if that if that's going to happen then it's going to happen mm. and if it doesn't um, I I I'm not going to define the success of the film by whether it, it gets nominated for an Oscar. Now in this case I didn't no I didn't have any grand expectations <clears throat> at all. I just knew we'd made a, a a good little film. It's one of my shortest ones and and that. Um, People seem to respond to it. You know, I, I, I think of all the films I've made, this is one that certainly has played as well as any of them in terms of in front of an audience. Right. And we've seen we've seen it on the festival circuit and in theatrical settings and special screenings for a long time now. And it just consistently engages people. It makes them laugh. It infuriates them, all those things. So I knew that it was connecting with people. And so when when it really connected with the branch documentary branch members enough to get nominated, it was it was sweet, you yeah. know. It was it was it was a it was a very sweet outcome for the film, for the story it's telling for, about this family. Um, and it and it also after I got past all the congratulations that were kind of blowing up my phone in my email <laughs> box, which was really nice. Yeah. Um, it also I also then did think back kind of in a more take a longer view and and i just felt like you know in, in in a lot of ways uh this film getting the nomination for me personally feels like a bit of an honor for all the stories over the years that i've had the pleasure and privilege to tell because they they like most of the films i've done were uh are people that most of us would never have heard of uh, if not for a film being made That's they're right. not they're not famous people. 
uh, at all. And most of my career has been devoted to telling the stories of people who are marginalized indeed in America and not famous and but still have, in my view, important stories to be heard. And the songs fit right in mm. in that way. And so I, I did I did kind of think <clears throat> about this more across my career. From a filmmaker's, from a doc filmmaker's perspective now, Steve, once you are notified that you have, that in fact your film is is one of the nominees for um, for best documentary of an uh, at the Oscars, how does life change for the next few weeks or the next month? Like what, <laughs> like, 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 can you share with us, what does that mean for you as the filmmaker? What do you now have to do? What are your responsibilities until, until the awards? Well, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time, um, going back and forth from Chicago to LA mm. and, and San Francisco, and I'm about to go to New York and then back to LA. So there's been, there's been quite a bit of travel to just go to screenings that, um, our team has set up, uh, to give, and, and it's not just like documentary, uh, you know, I mean, it's not just, um, Academy members opportunities yep. to see it. It's, we hope we certainly hope some of them will show up, right. um, but, but it's it's other people as well. So we've had a lot of really great screenings over the last month or and or since the since this came out. And but, um, you know, it's it's a lot of travel and and then, you know, and some interviews kind of like this, yes. uh, which, you know, to kind of help get the word out, because, you know, we don't have a big um, budget. There's there there there's no uh, billboards on Sunset. <laughs> uh, for our film, uh, out in LA to, and, and big full page ads in the New York times, right. the LA times, you know, that's, that's not the way we're rolling as they say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you do what you can do, but I, I'm also kind of like trying to look at this, like, you know, this is, this is, uh, uh this is just kind of a, a, a great sort of joy ride for the for the film and for those of us involved with it um, we're going to have a great turnout of folks who worked on the film at the academy awards and not just the sung family but mm -hmm. you know our terrific editors um da david simpson and and john farbrother and our dp tom bergman and uh, on and on and on so you know it's it's really we're just trying to enjoy enjoy this moment and then of course i'm trying to fit that in and around this massive uh, docu series that yes. we're finishing. Yes. Uh, so I'm like, when I'm done with you this morning, I'm going to turn my attention here at home to the Abbot because I I owe a couple of scenes uh -huh. uh, before I leave town next week uh, that I, that I need to work on. <laughs> so. uh, yeah. Uh, so is so is the doc life, isn't it? Yeah. Incredible. What will it mean to you if you actually win this thing? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think it'll, it'll be pretty great. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, and again, I think it goes back to it for me, it will just personally feel like it's not just about this film, although it very much is about this film, but that it's, a, it's about having, um, had a career where I've been able to commit myself to tell stories of some pretty extraordinary people and the songs fit right into that very much so and exemplify that and and it it'll be it'll be it'll also be great for them because this is a story that mm. wasn't going to get really told without us and and for them this was a vitally important story not just for them personally but for their community for the Chinatown community and they have and that has extended beyond Chinatown to the Chinese American community who have really embraced this film and been so supportive of this film yeah. as we as we have been out there in the world with it so it'll be really satisfying uh you know i think for them as well steve this has been an incredible conversation and uh this nomination certainly is a long time coming and uh I, I hope you the best, man. I, I hope to hear in March that, in fact, Abacus is the winner of Best Documentary. I, I would be really happy for you, man. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. We've been having a conversation with director Steve James. Steve's current film, Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, it has been nominated for an Academy Award. Steve, thank you so much for being on The Documentary Life, and um, we'll certainly be pulling for Abacus. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed talking.
Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.